North Dakota has many rivers and streams, from tiny creeks to wide and fast-flowing rivers. Rivers provide habitat for an abundance of wildlife. Many species of animals and fish are only found in and along rivers. Well, here we are, near the banks of the Missouri River. Mrs. Nelson, I thought we were supposed to be studying riparian areas today, not rivers. Well, rivers, streams, and riparian areas are all linked together. You can't have one without the other. The riparian area is an area of low land along a river or stream. It can be covered by trees or grasses. Because there's more moisture in the soil next to a river or stream, plants grow very thick and lush in the riparian area. Oh, I get it. I remember the photograph we had at school and how it showed the trees right next to the river. Are all riparian areas the same? Well, sort of. It depends on how big the river is and what part of the state it's in. Let's take a look at the map and see what rivers we can find. Hey, I found the Red River. It runs between Minnesota and North Dakota. The Red River Channel is shallow and water moves slowly northward. The Red River's riparian zone changes from wooded areas to grassy places. There's another river in the eastern part of the state, the Cheyenne River. The Cheyenne River is one of North Dakota's most beautiful and natural riverways. Parts of the Cheyenne River have been named a National Wild and Scenic River. Its riparian areas are predominantly woodland made up of American elm, bur oak, willows, and some cottonwood trees. I found a river with the same name as my brother, the James River. In the middle of North Dakota, the James River runs southward into South Dakota, where it eventually flows into the Missouri River at Yankton. The riparian zone along the James River is mainly grassland with tall, thick grasses. I found another river in the northern part of the state. I'm not sure how to pronounce it. Souris. Ah, uh, that's the Souris River, or Mouse River, Billy. It's believed French trappers called the river Souris, which is French for mouse, because its meandering path resembled a rodent's tail. The Souris River starts in Canada, loops into North Dakota, and then heads back into Canada. The Souris River has grassy, riparian areas with scattered trees. I found a river in the southwest corner of the state, the Little Missouri. The Little Missouri River runs through the southwestern portion of North Dakota, where it is drier and the riparian zone is made up of a variety of thick grasses, plants, and some cottonwood trees. You guys did a great job locating some of North Dakota's rivers. Now we're going to spend the rest of the day exploring the Missouri River and its riparian areas. The Missouri River is the largest river in North Dakota. It begins in southwestern Montana and runs through the middle of North Dakota. Eventually, it connects to the Mississippi River near St. Louis, Missouri. Isn't the Missouri River the one that Lewis and Clark traveled? That's right, Kayla. In fact, before Lewis and Clark, Native Americans lived along the banks of the Missouri and other rivers and streams in North Dakota for thousands of years. They depended upon the rich soils for growing crops, the surrounding bluffs for a view of the countryside, trees for their homes and fire, and the bountiful wildlife and fish for food. Lewis and Clark traveled up the Missouri River in what is now North Dakota during the fall and winter of 1804 and returned two years later on their trip home. Lewis and Clark's expedition party used many plants from the riparian area and hunted wildlife for food here. Some of the tall cottonwoods that grow along the river today were just getting started growing when Lewis and Clark passed by 200 years ago. Okay, let's take a walk and see what we can find. Hey, over here, look at this big tree. Oh, it's a cottonwood tree. Does anybody know what Lewis and Clark use cottonwood trees for? I know, they use them for boats. Very good, does anybody know what kind of wildlife uses cottonwood trees? My grandparents live near the Missouri and they have an eagle's nest in their cottonwoods. That's right, Bill. Bald eagles need large trees near water to nest in and a cottonwood tree would be a great place to build their nests. The tree has to be big as bald eagle nests are from five to nine feet wide. Nests also need to be close to water so that the birds can catch fish to feed to their young. Almost nine feet wide? Wow, that's big. I bet we could all fit in that nest. Trees in riparian areas such as cottonwood, oak, ash, and box elder 
grow tall and provide nesting areas for many birds, like the eagle and the warblers. Warblers? I don't think I've ever seen a warbler before. Well, probably not many people have. They're really tiny birds that flit and fly around in the tops of trees looking for insects. They're really hard to see. Hey look, over there, it's a different kind of tree. The leaves are more narrow than the cottonwood and it's not as tall. That's a willow jake, another common tree found along riparian areas in North Dakota. Look at this dead tree. It's too bad it had to die. Well, believe it or not, sometimes dead trees can be just as important as living ones. How can a dead tree be important? Well, dead trees are often hollow on the inside, and that can provide a sheltered living space for birds and mammals. Animals that use that hollow space are called cavity nesters. Cavity nesters? Cavity nesters are those animals that find a natural hole to enter in a dead tree, and then they build their nest inside the tree. North Dakota has more than 40 species of wildlife that use dead and dying trees for nesting. Some of the more common cavity nesting critters are woodpeckers, bats, squirrels, and raccoons. I know a duck that nests in hollow trees. Ducks don't nest in trees. Well, actually, Billy, some ducks do nest inside of trees. Like the wood duck. They're my favorite duck because they are so colorful. So why do people always cut down their dead trees? Well, it might be that they just don't realize how important dead trees are to some species of wildlife. Mrs. Nelson, look, come here quietly. It's a deer, a white-tailed deer. White-tailed deer flourish along the river bottoms in riparian areas of North Dakota. They rely on the security and escape cover of the tall trees and thick shrubs to raise their young. Hey everybody, look what I found over here. That's a weird looking plant. It looks like a bunch of grass all connected together. It's called horsetail or scouring rush. It's shaped like a little tube and likes to grow in moist areas along riparian zones like this. The pioneers used it to scour their cooking utensils. Well, we spend a lot of time exploring the riparian area from the shore, but I thought maybe we'd get a closer look and go out on the river. Let's all pack up and head over to the boat ramp. Yeah! Hey okay, everybody, life jackets on, ready to go? Okay, let's go. This is great. You can really see along the riverbank and get a great view of the river. What happened to those trees over there? They look like someone has cut them down. I think something's chewed those trees down. Anybody know what animal would have teeth strong enough to do that? I know, a beaver. Beavers are a true riparian animal. They use trees near the water to build their shelter, called a dam or a lodge, and they also use trees for food. Hey look, a little island in the middle of the river. That's a sandbar, Jake. It's a very important part of the riparian habitat. Some rivers have them and some don't. Can we get out and explore? Wait, we can't do that. See that sign? It says, restricted area. This area is a natural breeding ground for terns and plovers. These rare birds, their nests and eggs are protected under federal and state laws. Terns and plovers? What kind of birds are they? The tern that they're talking about is the least tern and the plover is the piping plover. Here's a picture of a least tern in my bird book. The least tern is the smallest member of the North American tern family. They are white and gray with a black cap on their head. They have forked tails and plunge under the water in search of small fish, crayfish, and water insects to eat. Least terns nest in colonies on beaches and sandbars. It says here in this book that the birds are declining across their native range and are endangered. What does that mean? It means that the number of least tern have been going down in this area and they're in danger of becoming extinct. So you mean there could be tern or plover nest out on this sandbar? I sure don't see any nest. It says here that these birds have eggs that are colored like the sand and pebbles. But if people don't see them, they might step on them. The piping plover is a small shorebird that makes its home on gravelly beaches, sandbars, and bare lake shores. They eat insects they find along the water's edge. Wow, I didn't know sandbars were so important for birds. I'll remember next time to be more careful. I wouldn't want to step on any eggs. That's great, Jake. We need to remember that we share all of our rivers with other wildlife and people. Look over there. It looks like a tiny lake in the middle of the river. Good eyes, Jake, but actually it's not really a lake. It's something we call an oxbow or backwater. 
Oxbows are wetlands that were formed many years ago when the river used to flow through here. Rivers change their pattern or location over time. This water we're on right now could be part of the shoreline riparian area in a hundred years from now. Why does a river do that? A river's natural flow takes sand away from one side of the bank and deposits it on the other. As the river channel moves in one direction, it leaves behind a portion of the old bend in the channel. This is what's called the oxbow. In the spring, the river rises and the oxbows are filled with water. Are these oxbows good for anything? Oxbows are one of the most important places for wildlife and fish in the riparian area. The water warms up fast and newly hatched fish such as crappie, northern pike, and walleye can find food and grow quickly. Oxbows are also places where shorebirds, ducks, and geese can find food and raise their families. Even rare reptiles like the soft-shelled or snapping turtles rely upon these areas to raise their young. I heard on a nature show that our oxbows are disappearing. That's right, Bill. People are changing the natural way rivers move and create oxbows. See that over there? What's all that concrete and rock doing on this riverbank? Well, it's called riprap. Holds up the soil so that the river can't erode or carve it out. That also prevents the water from moving out of its channel naturally, so oxbows can no longer form. Wow, look at all the houses being built along the river. Don't some of those houses flood being so close to the water? Why would someone want to live so close? Well, people like riparian areas. Rivers are very beautiful and people like to see all the woods and wildlife. Or they might want to be close so they can go fishing or boating. But if the river floods, there's bound to be problems. Riparian areas are usually flat, too, and the soil is moist, so these areas can provide good farmland for raising crops or grazing cattle. Well, I hate to say it, you guys, but it's time to head back for home. Oh, man. That was awesome. I love getting out on the river. You can really see things up close. Yeah, thanks Mrs. Nelson. I can really see that riparian areas sure are important for wildlife and people. I want to learn more about riparian areas and how we can preserve them. I'm going to get my parents to help me look up information on the internet. We could start a Keep Our River Clean campaign, or our school could pick up litter from the water or shoreline. That's a great idea. And hey, this was a really good field trip. We learned so much about North Dakota riparian areas and the animals that live there. We'll talk some more back at school tomorrow, okay? Let's get going. <laughs>